Hello, and welcome to Good Conversations. My name is Thompson Smith. We're honored to have with us again today in the studios of KSKC TV in Pablo, Montana, James Steele, Jr., the chairman of the Tribal Council of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes of the Flathead Indian Reservation. Mr. Steele was recently re-elected to the Tribal Council for his second term and then chosen again for his second term as the chairman of the tribes by his fellow Tribal Council members. Mr. Steele's father, James Steele Sr., was a Tribal Council representative also from the Arlee District in the 1980s for about a term and a half and served for one of those terms as the vice chairman of the tribes. So I guess it kind of runs in the family. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but thanks again for being here today. Yeah, lunch, Tom. Uh, last time we discussed a number of issues and uh, it made me realize there really are far too many things for us to possibly cover just in two half hours. Uh, but we touched on the bison range, on some of the health issues, substance abuse problems, some of the cultural issues and language survival, uh, some issues of sovereignty and self-determination and land reacquisition. Um, picking up on the land reacquisition today, uh, uh, th there is a real problem with that uh, f in terms of tribal sovereignty, isn't there, in terms of uncontrolled growth. Um, right now, I believe the tribal population is only about a fifth or a quarter of the population as a whole on the reservation. Isn't that right? Yeah, the the issue with population growth in is an issue for our reservation. Mm -hmm. And will we be able to uh, curb that? I think we can. Will we be able to eliminate the population growth on this reservation? Uh, in terms of the dominant society, I, I don't think that's a realistic mm -hmm. uh, uh, opportunity. What we try to do in terms of our land purchases now is a variety of things, and we have different, have had in the past different pots of money, like uh, we have an ARCO uh, mitigation fund. ARCO being Atlantic. the corporation responsible for the whole Superfund problem on the Clark Fork coming out of Anaconda and Butte? Exactly, and ARCO is an Atlantic Richfield company, mm -hmm. uh, and we are members of the uh, advisory council that determines how money, that mitigation money that the state has mm -hmm. is spent mm -hmm. along the upper Clark Fork from Butte all the way to Milltown. Mm -hmm. We are part of that, and we have a say so in, in how that money is spent. And then we have our own pot of money as a result of those mitigation damages that affected our tribes. I see, because uh, the Upper Clark Fork, of course, is within the Aboriginal territories of the Salish, Pondre, and Kootenai tribes, and so it damaged tribal resources that were guaranteed in the Hellgate Treaty, didn't it? It, 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 tra it damaged uh, traditional hunting and fishing areas and gathering areas mm -hmm. and cultural sites. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that, is that, that, as I understand it, that's because when the tribes uh, met with U.S. officials for the treaty, they, they reserved the right to continue doing those things in, in the in, Aboriginal in, territory. In, in usual and accustomed places and unclaimed uh, places. Mm -hmm. And that, that's exactly right. That's mm -hmm. where we, you know, part of the litigation, our portion of the litigation was some of those facts indeed. And as a result of that, we were able to uh, get a, a pot of money to be able to help buy back lands. Uh, and, and that money has to be spent in a manner that is consistent with the, the intent of it. Fish and wildlife rehabilitation, habitat rehabilitation. And uh, the other is the curb mitigation dollars. And I think mm. that that has been a good help also for supplementing the tribal acquisition budget, but... And explain that money. Why are the tribes getting money? Well, that's basically... It's from Kerr Dam. From the concern. impact of Kerr Dam, the impact of Kerr Dam uh, being built and then the impacts of, the, you know, the changing of the lake and the, mm -hmm. the changing of the, the natural way of the natural flow of the Flathead River and such. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But those, but what I want to say is that those monies have helped us, especially along the Flathead River and the Jocko River, uh, purchase a lot of that land along those rivers. I think the Flathead River, on a, if, you, if you're able to get a, a modern, up-to-date uh, land status map, we own just about all the land 
along the Flathead River on both sides, mm. uh, all the way through the reservation, and and similarly with the Jocko River. Mm. And the Jocko River we've concentrated on f to get it back into its natural flow, natural hydrograph, because it's it's a very good uh, bull trout habitat, mm. and that's our native one of our native fish yeah. from our areas and. And now a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. Very, very threatened. Mm -hmm. And I know I've heard stories from my elders, my f grand folks, you know, talking about being able to, to fish for bull trout that were just huge. Huge, And yeah. plentiful, and mm -hmm. we, we don't see that anymore. And it'd be nice to someday to be able to get to a point where they're no longer on the endangered species list mm -hmm. and they're bountiful and plentiful. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways that the the issue of uncontrolled growth is being dealt with is simply through these con this continuing land reacquisition for habitat and open space uh, under ARCO and Kerr money. There are also kind of more cooperative efforts between the tribes and the county, aren't there, on the, planning? Yeah, we, trying to you know, I, we have in our lands department, uh, Janet Campbell's been real good at spearheading that from, from mm -hmm. the tribal's point of view, our tribe's point of view. Mm -hmm. And Lake County in the last few years had went through a zoning and kind of a density map right. type of effort and we were able to get get included in that and made our recommendations and originally when you looked at the map it didn't make any uh, didn't make an acknowledgement for um, the Mission Mountains mm -hmm. in our, our wildlife corridors that we've established. Mm. And, and through that process, we were able to, to get that recognized. Mm -hmm. That look, there's a wildlife corridor that we've established as a tribes in, in these areas. And there's the Mission Mountain Wilderness that we've established, the, the, uh, uh, the other areas like that sure. to set aside from, from growth. Right. And so that's, you're right, that's another effort that we've enjoined. Mm -hmm. And I mean, do you feel that the that the plan that emerged from, from Lake County um, and the ways that it in some ways mirrors what the tribes themselves have set forth in their own planning documents, does that give us some hope that there's going to be increasing uh, uh, joint work, common ground, I guess, between tribal people and non-Indians in terms of trying to protect open space and, and habitat and things like that on the reservation? Well, I think it is a good sign of, of cooperation with, with uh, the counties, uh, the county and counties that we have, Missoula County, Flathead, Sanders, and Lake. Mm -hmm. Lake, of course, being the one that's in the main population corridor of the reservation. Mm -hmm. But it is, it is a, an area of cooperation. Yeah. Um, is it a perfect agreement? No, there, there's. I don't think there's a, ever such a thing as a perfect agreement. But, mm -hmm. but it is a good agreement, and it is a good effort at cooperation. Hmm. Well, in in our discussion there, you you talked a bit about the Flathead River, and you and I both have have gone to some of the Flathead Basin Commission meetings. I'm yes. a citizen member on the commission, and um, the river is is in dire threat at this time, isn't it? It, it is, and I, I, I appreciate uh, your participation on the Basin Commission because what we have there is is an effort in the East Kootenays of Canada, some coal bed methane development and potentially some uh, mine, uh, traditional mining development there that, that has a great potential to impact the Flathead, the north part of the Flathead River all the way down to Flathead Lake and, and beyond. And it's kind of interesting that we talked about the Clark Fork River. We can see what uh, what the great big boom in, in Anaconda and, and Butte, the copper mines there have done and what we're dealing with now. You know, we, we, we're really proud to be a part of the restoration and rehabilitation and, and the removal of Milltown Dam site, mm -hmm. but you know they have to remove all of that poisonous settlement, right. uh, settling of all of that the mining that flowed down the river and mm -hmm. kind of stopped up there at Milltown Dam. They've got to move all of that stuff, and that's millions and millions of dollars and and construction and mm -hmm. people cleaning and trying to put the Clark Fork River, particularly the Upper Clark Fork River, back. 
to a place of where it was when we signed the treaty. Mm -hmm. And now we're looking at that in terms of the Flathead River and and, and I'd encourage people that it, it, it's a big concern and I know... There's uh, a historical lesson to learn there, isn't there? There, there is a historical lesson. On, on the one hand we have when we signed the treaty, you know, the Clark Fork River was in fine shape. We had our fishing abilities there. And, and now, just within the last year or two, I, I understand that they've just now started to see some fish starting to return into mm -hmm. the Clark Fork. Right. And it's taken a, a long time to get that accomplished. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, mm -hmm. the Flathead Basin Commission, uh, we have, the tribes have a a legislated seat on that commission mm -hmm. and uh, Thurman Trosper was the very first yep. uh, leader of that effort back mm -hmm. in the 70s and 80s and really helped get our voice into that process. And, mm -hmm. and, and Clayton it, Matt has been doing an excellent job of representing Clayton the Clayton has yeah. done a wonderful job in help, helping with that effort mm -hmm. and uh, but we really need to one thing that we need to do in that effort is get a greater understanding of what our sister uh, Tunaha tribes in in Canada what what they think about it, and we're st we're still in the middle of that. R Ruben, uh, Council Member Ruben Mathias, and mm -hmm. Council Member uh, Mike Kenmill are real good at at helping figure those things out with sure. with those communities. That could be a real key in this whole puzzle, couldn't it? Well, yeah, because the the uh, the effort of the mining and development is on the Canadian side of the border, mm -hmm. and uh, we've had good support from Senators Tester and Bacchus, and the governor's office has been real helpful, mm -hmm. and we appreciate that support. In uh, but the our Canadian uh, Kootenai Native brothers and sisters on the north side of the border have an opportunity to have more influence with the Canadian government than than we do. Yeah and we just need to figure out what that is and tap into that. Sure. It's my understanding from being on the commission is it's going to be hard to stop this. I mean, there are billions of dollars to be made by these corporations that are proposing to develop these things. It, it, it will be hard. I don't think it's impossible, but it, it will be tough and it will be hard. But I think we on, on the south side of the border have the benefit of having a good chunk of the federal government behind us for once. The yep. Secretary of State's office, uh, I know has written letters, uh, Colin Powell and I think yep. Condoleezza Rice I believe have too, but yep. they've expressed concerns to the Canadian government. So that's been beneficial, but, but there's a lot of money riding on this mm -hmm. internationally. No question. And the, there is an international treaty between the U.S. and Canada, the Boundary Waters Treaty, the I boundary, guess. Yeah, the Boundary Waters Treaty that, uh, and I believe that's where the international, what's it, joint commission that's right. set up to kind of mm -hmm. help with those issues dealing with the cross-boundary and border issues. And I guess the gist of the treaty is that one country can't pollute waters that are going to flow into the well, other country. Exactly, exactly. In theory, anyway. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the U.S. isn't completely got clean hands on that either. So, no. so it's kind of a, you know, the Cana we we hammer on the Canadians over the issue of this particular area, but the Canadians can point to other areas where the U.S. has okay. not got clean hands either. So. Mm -hmm. uh, well, let's let's keep moving on some other environmental issues, if if you would. Sure. Um, one of the things that, that the coal in the North Fork relates directly to is the whole issue of global warming. Mm -hmm. um, is this something that the council has, has faced at all? Is it, is it something you see as a, as a looming threat to the tribes and the reservation? I think in terms of global warming, we, we've started down the path many years ago with the Class Air 1 quality standards. You know, that, I think that, that may have been pre before everyone was talking global warming as the modern buzzword is. So I think we've kind of been a little more proactive than maybe the U.S. government has mm -hmm. by adopting some of these standards, you know, class one air quality and water quality standards. Mm -hmm. And um, those, are, those are our efforts to, to address global warming mm -hmm. and our, our abilities. Also yeah. in terms of setting aside portions of our reservation to be like the Mission Mountain Wilderness, for example, yep. to be uh, left alone and untouched. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
And of course, the Mission Mountain Wilderness holds the high peaks that hold the snow that supply the water. Supply the water. And yeah. one of the main anticipated impacts of global warming is a reduction in snowpack. So mm -hmm. uh, this could impact some of the other issues that the tribes are. Well, exactly. And I think we're, we're doing our part to try to to preserve those watersheds mm -hmm. in, in, in a good proactive and ecological manner. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the part that we're trying to do in terms of global warming is, is that. Sure. So. Thank you. Uh, we'll take a quick break right now, just for 60 seconds. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. And we're back talking with James Steele, Jr., the chairman of the Tribal Council of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes. James, thanks again for yeah, taking the time th with us. Thank you, Tom. Before <clears throat> our break, we were talking about issues uh, dealing with water, and uh, that provides us a good segue to talking about uh, just a little issue the tribes are dealing with, water rights. Well, the water rights issue has been going on for quite a few years, and the Montana Reserve Water Rights Compact Commission is the entity that we are dealing with and negotiating with. And um, that sunsets in 2009. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're hopeful that we can get a negotiated settlement by, by, the, uh, by the sunset date of the next legislature in 2009. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, what we're doing is we're preparing our water rights claims mm -hmm. on the reservation because if the sunset occurs and we do not have a negotiated settlement, we, I believe we all on the reservation to have a water rights claim have a certain amount of days to file that claim. Mm -hmm. And right now we're preparing, the feds are preparing, and mm -hmm. the state's preparing, and everyone else that had on the reservation has a water rights claim should be at least contacting the state or the tribes and feds hmm. and ask them what's going on and should take a keen interest in what's going on with the negotiations. Hmm. It yeah. sounds like that would just be a gigantic legal mess, wouldn't it? Well, it certainly would, and I think if, if any of you that are listening to us are going to go into law school or be an attorney, that would be a good job to get because I know in Wyoming in the Wind River Reservation in the state of Wyoming have been fighting for years and years and years. Hmm over their water rights and it's been in the courts and mm -hmm. so uh, if you want to go into law and we end up in court it, it'll be a long and I imagine, a lifetime career. <laughs> I imagine. I mean here the, the, the water stuff is so complicated too with the res reservation having been open to non-Indians, the flatted irrigation project and of course the, the prior tribal rights. So. Well I would give credit to the state of Montana. They've, they've negotiated and settled and, and we're the last one now that, mm -hmm. that I know of. Mm -hmm. uh, the Forest Service, the Blackfeet Nation, and ourselves were the last three. Blackfeet have a, uh, a settlement in principle, and I think mm -hmm. they've signed off on that. But we're the last one, and I think our reservation, the Salish and Kootenai Tribes and Flathead Reservation, I think it's the most complex uh, water issue than anywhere on the res and anywhere in the state of Montana is what I'm trying to say. Right. Uh, you, you've, you've iterated all of the, the complexities and th that's a key component, component mm -hmm. parts of why this is a complex mm -hmm. settlement and uh, mm -hmm. negotiation. 
And uh, what are your hopes for, uh, how much do you, do you feel hopeful for, that a settlement will be reached? Well, I'm very hopeful that we'll reach a negotiated settlement. But if we don't reach a negotiated settlement, we're, we're, ready, for, we're ready for going into court. We have to be. Yeah. We, we don't have any option if we don't reach a negotiated settlement. Mm -hmm. um, we as the tribes have to be ready to file our claims. And the key points of disagreement are what at this point? Well, the key points of disagreement is some years ago the tribes had put their proposal on the table and basically that proposal says we recognize existing uses mm -hmm. but we also want understood that we own the water surface and subsurface on all of it, all of it on the reservation. Mm -hmm. We also believe that there should be a joint administration of the water on the reservation jointly administered by the tribes and the, and the state. Mm. And uh, we, we believe those, those are the two real key components that I'm, mm. that I'm aware of that are the sticking points. Um, and the state is not, at this point, willing to accept that the tribes own the water, is that? Well, that, what that's, I understand. that's a fair assessment, I believe, mm -hmm. and our point is, is we do, but we're willing to say, let, let's jointly administer what we have on the reservation. And they also are resistant to that idea? Yes, yes. They, they suggest we have a split up type of a thing. We say, no, it makes more sense to be in one shop. You don't have to have people going to two different places and, right. and so forth. They should be able to go you know, one place that's jointly administered. Yeah. It certainly seems that the experience of natural resource management suggests that it's, it's far easier to manage a resource that crosses boundaries within one, one roof, under one roof. Well, that's what our, our thoughts are and our assessment is. Mm -hmm. um, I think we can do a better job together, and I think, I, I most definitely think we can do a job Mon uh, regulating and administering the water on the reservation just just ourselves, yeah. but of course that gets into a lot of complexities with the diversity of our community makeup, you know, tribal and non-tribal members. Yeah. But I think we've done a, uh, you know, it's been some time ago. Someone was challenging me over the tribes administering things over non-tribal people on our reservation, and mm -hmm. I. I just simply told them, I said, well, do you know who you get your power from? Yeah, I did it from Mission Valley Power. Well, do you know that the tribes run that? Well, no, I didn't know. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, years ago we had a big fight over that, and mm -hmm. and I think we've proven that we can manage a federal utility on behalf of all the people on the reservation and do a good job at it. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a variety of other examples that we can give, but in terms of water rights, I think we can demonstrate right. a unitary administration of that made up of uh, bilateral partners mm -hmm. uh, is a good way to go. I guess a person could go to Missoula and see what they'll pay for electric rates down there. For well, yeah, person. electric <laughs> rates and water prices too, what they probably pay for their water down there too in terms of city water or other things, but, sure. but uh, yeah. Hmm. Uh, we have so little time and so much ground to cover. Um, let me touch on issues of education, jobs, uh, income level and poverty. Uh, okay. Those are kind of intertwined issues. Mm -hmm. um, what, what do you see the tribe's challenges and opportunities in that area? Well, I think in terms of uh, jobs and education and those things, I think the, the education that we have in the variety of areas, Two Eagle River School, the uh, Santa Kootenai College, mm -hmm. and Kicking Horse Job Corps that we're working on, uh, I think are all avenues and opportunities that we are trying to expand on and improve upon to provide that education for our membership. Mm -hmm. Because if you, in, a, in a lot of things that we do today, you have to have that basic education, whether even if it's driving trucks or being in construction trades or, or, or what have you, more professional trades, whatever it is, you need that basic education. Mm -hmm. And we need to do whatever we can to help that for because that often nowadays is the key to get a job. Right. You know, you can have the job there, but if you don't have the people that know or have the skills to do those jobs, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to be forced with 
trying to find someone to fill that job. And that's kind of the constant challenge for the tribes is, is that is finding people that know or understand or have the expertise in specialized areas to fill those jobs. And yeah. We want tribal member employment 100%, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, we have to train our people to be able to fill those jobs. Sure. Yeah, it's a it's been a long effort. I mean, it seems that's been talked about by the council for many years. Mm -hmm. And and I think not not only talked about, but I think the the area where the tribes have put their money where their mouth is is things such as Sailors Kootenai College, helping support Sailors Kootenai College, mm -hmm. helping support Two Eagle River School, helping support our college students that are away at various higher uh, education facilities, you know, and often we'll get letters uh, from time to time from our college students that are at, whether they be the University of Montana or, or, or where have you, we'll write letters back saying thank you for helping provide for for my college education, you know, through the BIA fundings that we get that we're able to put towards that and some of the, the other dollars that we're able to put towards college scholarships. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a lot of tribal people that have benefited from that. Mm. You know, I, I was listening to uh, Dr. Muski on the radio the other day, public radio, and and she talked about how her education and things helped her to be able to be a doctor that yeah. serves our community. So I think I she's heard a that interview as well. Great example yeah. of of our, our tribal people doing something that they really enjoy to benefit all of us. Hmm. That's great. Um, well, I, I wanted to thank you for the two half hours that you shared with us here uh, on Good Conversations. Uh, anything else that you'd like to uh, make mention of before we, we sign off here in terms of your hopes for the coming well, year? Well, I'm just real optimistic. I'm thankful to, to the membership for, for their support and confidence in me in the last election had a very historic uh, uh, turnout for, for my re-election efforts. And I, I sure am humbled by that mm. and I'm humbled by the opportunity to serve another four years and excited at the same time and humbled and excited at the same time for another couple of years as chairman. Mm. So, Great. Well, thanks again, James. Yeah, Lem Lemsch, Tom. Appreciate you being here. Lem Lemsch. Thanks for joining us on Good Conversations. We hope to see you next time. In the meantime, if you have any comments, suggestions, questions for us, please email us at goodtalk at blackfoot.net. Thanks again, and see you next time.